Hello and welcome to my session. Hopefully you can all hear and see that OK. So before we get started, uh, just a quick introduction for those of you who haven't seen any other of the presentations uh, this morning. The event has a code of contact, so be aware of others, be respectful and all of the, the usual things to be treated how you'd want to be treated. It's also worth noting today that uh, donations are going to the National Museum of Computing. And we have a number of sponsors as well. As we go through the presentation and the rest of the day, uh, make sure you make it social and uh, use Twitter with the uh, hashtag DDD2021 and tag at developer day. So on to the main presentation. We're going to talk about maze generation in C-sharp for fun. Before we get started though, a bit about myself. My name is John Kilmister and I'm a software engineer. I've been working in .NET now uh, for about 15 years or so, mostly in C-sharp. Um, I currently work as a software architect and you can find me on Twitter at John Kilmister if you have any questions after this or you wish to follow me. I also have a blog at blueboxes.co.uk where you can find articles on C Sharp and Azure. So as we go through this presentation today, um, I have got Discord open. So if you've got any questions, just drop them in there and I'll pick them up as we go through and there'll definitely be time at the end to pick up any other questions that we haven't quite gone over. What are we going to cover today? Well, we're going to talk about how it got started or how I got started looking at, at mazes and maze generation. Then we'll have a look at an introduction to mazes, talking about the different algorithms and the different ways people have solved mazes in the past. We'll take a deeper dive onto the backtracker algorithm and go through the theory of that. And we'll also look at the C-sharp code that we need to generate mazes. Once we've generated the maze, we need to actually draw it out. So we'll go through the code we need to render a maze before looking at how we can make more intricately shaped mazes like the one we saw in the title slide. And finally, if you've been inspired by it, then we'll have a look at some uh, next steps. So as I said, Discord's there. If you've got any questions or you just want to, to give us a quick wave to know uh, know you're all listening and it's coming through fine. That'd be great. How did it all start for me? Well, I started looking at mazes about four or five years ago. I entered a competition called the JS 13K Games, which in which you have to generate a game or create a game in less than 13K of JavaScript. If you've not heard of it and you're interested in JavaScript, it's well worth uh, looking at it and it's a um, it's a really good way of kind of pushing yourself and learning new things. But back when I did this challenge, I decided to create a game based around a, a maze. And that's when I started looking at the different maze algorithms and the different ways that you could programmatically generate it. In this particular game, you navigated through a maze and when you hit a particular glitch, it would regenerate the maze to make it particularly challenging. That was a long time ago now and it was a long time ago and more recently I thought I'd revisit uh, mazes. As in most ideas it kind of starts with a drawing or a post-it note and at this time I wanted to create a, a, a tree-shaped maze for some uh, Christmas cards. So from that initial spark of an idea I went back and now working more in C-sharp I decided to to generate a an ASCII maze in C-sharp just to get started. Following that, I broke it out and, and started creating tree-shaped mazes, although it didn't quite look right. So I rendered it using GDI plus into a square maze. <clears throat> and then I rendered the tree maze out using GDI plus. And I even took that and threw it into Photoshop and made the lines a, a bit more interesting. But it still wasn't quite right and I was exploring different ideas and trying different things and that's one reason we kind of do do these tasks or or take on these little projects for fun is to experiment and just kind of see where we go didn't necessarily at the beginning 
know what the final result was going to look like, just have a spark of a, a, an idea. But I took that and I used an image as a source and generated a, a tree maze like that. And eventually uh, I, I made it fully colour and kind of ended up with, with the system that I wanted to, to go with at the end. And that kind of leads me nicely on to the, uh, the shaped mazes. And that's where we'll kind of end our presentation today is, is by the end of the presentation, we will have got to uh, show you how to generate these shaped mazes. Let's start right back at the beginning. And look at, well, what is a maze and what is a labyrinth? Well, a labyrinth has a single path all the way through. There's no dead ends or alternate routes. While a maze has many dead ends, lots of long corridors, false routes and various other characteristics. And it's mazes that we're going to spend our time looking at today. So how do we actually go about generating a maze in code? Well, much like most problems in programming, it can actually be solved in multiple different ways. And there are about 11 or 12 classic maze algorithms, completely different ways of generating a maze-like structure. But why do we have different maze algorithms? Why isn't there the one way of, of solving this problem or the most optimum way? Well, if we take a look at these two examples, on the left, we've got Prim's algorithm and on the right, we've got the recursive division algorithm. They actually generate two very different shaped mazes. They're both mazes, however, the kind of characteristics of it are different. And each of the maze algorithms come down to a number of smaller factors. The length of the corridors is determined by which algorithm is used, the number of dead ends that you have, the length of those dead ends. And then certain algorithms have different biases. This, for example, has a horizontal bias, so you can see a lot of the corridors run along the horizontal axis. We don't have time today to go through all of the different maze algorithms, all 11 of those. However, if you do want to have a look at them in more detail, there's a, a great website here in which you can uh, play a little animation that will take you through each of the steps in generating the, the mazes. Today's focus is going to be on the backtracker algorithm, and I'll take you through first of all the theory and then how we actually go and implement that in C sharp. So with the backtracker algorithm we have a number of steps that we go through. The first step is to select a starting cell and we can actually use any cell in the grid as a starting point. For this we'll just use 00, zero for now which I've represented with the red square. The next step is to choose an available neighbour so a neighbour that we've not visited previously. Here we've got two options and you would randomly pick one of those. We then break through into that cell and as you can see it's removed the wall between cells 00, zero and zero, 01. And then we repeat and we just keep repeating and repeating, breaking through from one cell into another. And as we do this we're carving a channel through all of the, the cells. We eventually get to a point where there are no neighbours that we haven't visited before and that's where the backtracking element of it comes in. So we go back to the previous cell and we see have we, vis have we got any unvisited neighbours and we keep repeating that until we do get to a point where we have an unvisited neighbour. Now, in this example, our unvisited neighbour is just a single cell. However, in larger mazes, that might be a whole area that we've missed. And once we've done that, we then carve a path into it and then we backtrack out of that. And we continue this until eventually we return back to our starting cell and the maze is complete. There is one final step though. Although this is a complete maze, we don't have an entrance or an exit. 
And we can pick any two exterior walls for our entrance and exit because in a perfect maze, you can get from any point to any other point. So we'll just carve a hole into the uh, eastern, uh, the western wall of zero zero and the northern wall of zero two. Now, if we look at this on a larger scale, we can see how it works a bit better. So we carve our initial path, we get to a point where there's no neighbours and we reverse back out and fill that in. This animation is made up of about 1,600 steps and takes about a minute and a half to run. However, if we run this and don't generate an animation from it, just let the code run, it takes a few seconds for it to complete the process. And like our smaller maze, that once we've finished, we end up all the way back at the start. That's the theory. So now let's have a look at how we actually go and generate that in code. Well, the first thing we need to decide is how, how do we um, store this data? A maze is a graph structure. So you go from one node to an adjacent node to another adjacent node. But we're just looking at a two dimensional grid at the moment with these mazes. So we just need a way of storing that in C sharp. And an array is the most natural way of doing that. But we've got two dimensions. We've got rows and we've got columns. We can represent this in a jagged array or an array of arrays. We initially create a, an array and inside that each item is an array itself. We can index it with row and column to set the value of the array. And to get the height and the width of the entire grid, we just have to get the length of the outer array for the height. And then any of the child arrays will give us the width. But a jagged array isn't the most efficient way of creating the structure. And in C-sharp, we can actually use a multi-dimensional array. We only have to initialize it using a single command. The indexer, you pass both the row and a column in. And then to get the height and the width, we actually have to use the get length method. And the reason for this is that although here we've got a two dimensional array, you can have many more dimensions. So we call get length and pass in the zero for the zero index and one for the, the, uh, for the second, um, second dimension. And this multi-dimensional array, as you can see here, the code is shorter, but the IL is also a lot shorter. So it's a much more efficient way of doing it. So continuing forward, we'll use the multi-dimensional array. So we've got our data structure. We now have to decide what are we going to put in the data structure? So one option is to actually represent the walls and the corridors as two separate entries in the array. And we can see here that columns 0, 2, 4 and 6 and rows 0, 2, 4 and 6 all have walls in them at the moment. And if we want to navigate from our starting position at 1, 1 into cell 1, 3, we just toggle cell 1, 2 to no longer be a wall. And this means we can store the data as a Boolean array. And it's relatively simple to render it out because as you loop over the cells, you just decide to render a wall or don't render a wall. And this is the way the Python library mazelib works. However, as we come on later to create shaped mazes, this no longer works for us as you have to have cells either side of every, um, every part of the shape. There is an alternative, however, and that is to store all the walls in each cell. So in this case, we're storing all four walls in cell 00, zero and we want to move to zero, 01. So we first have to break a hole and remove one of the walls in zero, 00. We also then remove the opposing wall in our target cell, zero, 01. And once they've been removed, we can then navigate to it. But how do we store four 
different values into one entry in our array. Well, that's where a flags enum comes in. If you haven't seen a flags enum before, they're very similar to a standard enum in C sharp. However, we can actually com combine the values together into a single value, and then we can write code to pull it back out to say which items are being stored. And that actually works behind the scenes is that when this gets converted into the binary, you can see that the indicator is switched to one. And then the next one is one along, next one's long, one along and so on. And this means that we can easily query to see which values are stored and they can be combined together. It also means we can actually write our flags enum in a slightly different way. We can actually use a, a shift operator to shift the bits across. It's exactly the same, but it's just a slightly different way of writing it and slightly easier. So we know that we can use a flags enum, but how do we actually go and set the value? Well, we can use bitwise operators. So to set the initial value here, we're setting the eastern wall, southern wall, western wall, and northern wall, and we're using the bitwise operator or operator to join them all together into a single value. When we come to break through from one wall to another, we take all the existing values and then we remove the eastern direction. On the adjacent cell, we're doing the opposite. We're taking all the existing values and removing the western wall. When it finally comes to rendering it out, we can check using the has flag method to see if the northern enum value or the north enum value has been set against that existing cell. So we now know the data structure and we know how we're going to store things in it. Let's have a look at the algorithm we'll actually need now to, to generate it. So in this implementation, we're going to be using a C sharp stack collection. If you haven't seen a stack collection before, it's the opposite of a queue. So where a queue is FIFO, first in, first out, um, a stack works in LIFO, last in, first out. So we start the process by creating that collection. We then push our initial value in, our starting point. And in this case, we're gonna go with zero, zero. I've added in a little sample here that is just a, a single row of cells. It would work the same with a full grid for a maze, but for simplicity, we're just going to work with these three cells. So we're going to continue our loop while we've got items in our tracking list. So we've added the first item to the tracking list, zero, zero. And I've kept this down in the bottom corner here so you can see what we're tracking. The first thing to do is take a peek at the item in the stack. This means that we can have a look at it without actually removing it. And the top item is zero, zero. We will then get the next available neighbor. So any neighbor that we haven't visited before. We do have one of those. So we will then break through the wall into that new cell and then add it to our tracking list. So break through it and add it into our tracking list. We then go around the loop again, and now we look at what the top item is on the list, and it's now one zero. So we go and get all the neighbors. We do have one, so we then break through to that and then push it to our list. Now on our third iteration, we do the same again. So we check the top cell, which is two zero. We get its neighbors. This time, we don't have any unvisited neighbours because we've completed uh, navigating to every cell. So this time, instead of breaking through, we actually take the top item off the list. Now we go back around again and get the current cell. And the current cell this time is one zero. It doesn't have any neighbours, so again, we remove the top item off the list and go around again until We've completed it. Our tracking item now has nothing left in the list 
and the maze is now complete. So that's one way of solving the uh, solving the algorithm. But another way of doing this is using recursion. Before we have a look at an implementation of the backtracker algorithm using recursion, let's have a look at how recursion works in C sharp code. So this is maybe a more familiar scenario. We want to draw out a tree of folders. So we create a method called draw folder. It initially renders the folder icon and then it loops through each child folder rendering that. And the way that it does it is that we call the same method again, draw folder. So it gets to the first child called draw folder, which loops back around and draws its folder icon and then draws all its children. And for each child, it loops around again. Once it's finished drawing the last child, it goes back up and then it will continue to, to draw the rest of the children for the parent. And once it's finished all of those, it will go back up to that parent and draw all of the, the remaining children for that. And that's how the recursion works until eventually you have the entire tree. How does that look on the recursive backtracker algorithm? Well, so the first thing we need to do is create a method and we're going to create a method called move to. We'll start by calling that method with our starting coordinates 0, 0 and also passing in the grid. So we're now in here and we're going to get all of the possible directions. Now, unlike the last example in which we got an available, only the available neighbours, in this one we're getting all the directions and we are um, we are picking them at random, but we'll be going through north, south, east and west. We then work out what the next column and row will be. We'll have a look at that a bit more in detail in a minute. And we see, are we able to navigate to it? So if we had got north, we wouldn't be able to navigate to it because there are no cells above where we are. So we skip around and we go around again. And then our next direction may be south. And that is available. So at that point, we then break through the cells. And then we call the move to method with our new row and new column. So at this point, we don't ever return that we don't return the grid. We actually jump into the move to method again. It's where the recursion comes in. And our new parameters are one zero. So we get all the directions again and we go through. And this time the north direction is still first. No. And the south direction comes through and we can go through this one. So it is available. So once again, we break through. And then we call the move to method, which calls this again. And we end up now in here with cell in, in row two, column zero. We get all the directions and we loop through, but we can't move to the north, south, east or west. So we actually loop through four times and we then return the grid. At this point, we return back here to the end of the move to method. However, when we return, we're now finishing off where we were previously. The parameters for row and col are now one zero. And we may have gone through two of the directions previously. We have the other two to go through. So we will loop again and finish it off doing the east direction. In this case, it's not available. And then the west direction, which again is not available. So we return the grid. Now back here inside the method where the parameters were zero and zero. And again, we go through the remaining directions that we haven't been and we return the grid and the maze is complete. Now, if this was a full grid, you'd be going back and forth, up and down the stack. So let's have a, in this example, um, I've simplified a lot of this. We've pulled out, get all directions into a method. We've pulled is available out into a method um, and, and we've uh, got some lists here. 
So let's have a little bit of a deeper look now and it's the exact same code, but without those methods. So the directions. All we're really doing here is a list of each of the directions or an array, sorry, should I say, of each of the directions. And because we want the maze to be a completely random generated, we just call random.next on an order by so that each time we go through, um, each time we go into the move to method, we end up uh, with directions in a different order. We then go into our, our loop. Now, in order to work out which column and row is next, we're actually just looking at based on the direction, are we going to go, are we going to take one away? Are we going to add one to the list? So what we can see here is that our direction X, which is our horizontal direction, if we're east, that means we're going to add one. If we're going west, we take one away and north and south doesn't have any um, increment or decrement to the X value. Similarly for the, the Y. We then later on also have a reverse list. So we can, if we're going east, the reverse of that is west and north, the reverse is south so on and so forth. Now there is available logic that was pulled out into a separate method. Well, the main part of this is checking the boundaries, making sure we're not falling off the left-hand side of the maze or the right-hand or the top or the bottom. However, the final bit, the final condition is really important. The way we decide if we visited a cell before is does it have all directions? So when we initialize our array, we actually actually populate it with every cell having all four directions in. And this means that it's available to still to visit. As we saw before, we then remove the direction that we're currently looking at. And there's our collection, uh, our dictionary should to say, to reverse, to find the reverse direction for the neighboring cell. And then we call the, the move to as we've seen it. So it's actually quite a short bit of code. We've probably got 20 or 30 lines there to generate a whole maze. But what about actually rendering the maze out? At this point, we've only got it in memory. So let's have a look at how we draw it. Remembering this is what we're aiming to do. Draw a maze with thick corridors and thin walls. As we're in C sharp, we're going to stick with GDI plus today. Um, however, a lot of these techniques could be applied if we were wanting to render it out as an SVG or in JavaScript on a HTML5 canvas or various other bits and pieces. We have a save to JPEG method and the typical GDI, we just uh, initialize a bitmap and then we create a graphics object. And the graphics object is like a canvas that we can we can draw to. The first thing we do is set a background color by calling uh, graphics.clear. In this case, I'm just passing in a gray, uh, gray background color. The final bit is to draw the image. So we draw from that graphics object back into the bitmap and we save it out as a JPEG. But if we were to run this, it would just give us a gray square box. So to actually draw the maze itself, we loop through each of the rows and then each of the columns and we draw each cell individually. But what does it mean to draw each cell? Well, we just check, is there a northern wall? And if so, we draw a line across the top of the cell. If there's a southern wall, we draw one across the bottom of the cell. Same for east and same from west. And that's really it. Once you've done that, it will look, do this for every single cell and draw you the entire maze. Moving on to shaped mazes now. Square mazes are all well and good, but if we want to be a bit more creative and a bit more fun, we can we can actually create mazes. <coughs> we can create mazes in any shape. You may remember back at the beginning we had the flags enum, and there's this value that sits at the top of the flags enum called non. It's worth noting a flags enum, unlike a normal enum. The first item cannot be zero if you want to use the has flags. So we've put none in there with a value of, of one. And the way this works is that we can take 
our initialized grid and we can set cells to be non if we don't want them to render. And then we initialize all the other cells with all four walls. And if you remember, the algorithm will look that it can only move to cells that have all four walls. When I was playing around with this, I started by creating myself a, a template just in a text file. I put in zeros for where I wanted it to be a blank and one where I wanted all four walls to be. Um, and this this kind of worked. So, um, yeah, we ended up with a tree of sorts. Uh, turns out handwriting these templates with zeros and ones in didn't really um, didn't really work that well. It took a long time. Weirdness, get get some weirdness if you see over here. It's, it's kind of, yeah, not really great shape. Also, uh, because these are not a monospace uh, font that we're looking at here, it's a lot narrower than it is when we actually render it out. So if I want to quickly generate a new one of a, a shape like a balloon, then that's going to take some time. So this part of the experimentation, when we start, um, start with these things, we don't quite know how things are going to work out. Um, but I experimented with lots of different options and I tried actually generated some of these templates in Excel and various other techniques. Eventually realized that images are just pixels and pixels can we can just use pixels to work out if we can render it or not. So PNGs have transparent cells. So if we decide not to render the transparent cells, but to have our maze render where there, are, where there is actually color or texture, we can create a grid like this quite quickly. So to load in our image and initialize our, initialize our grid, all we have to do is load our bitmap in, initialize our array, and then loop through each um, each row and each cell. And as we go through each, we extract the pixel just using the get pixel method. And then we check the alpha channel. And if the alpha channel is transparent, that's just a constant for zero. Then we decide to have we set the value to none. Otherwise, we set the value to all directions. And that's just a constant of our four directions. Um, all um, all together and then we return the grid so from that we then get our nice balloon shaped grid one of the considerations with this though is that we can no longer start our carving of the maze from zero zero because if we did that we'd be up here and the rules say that we could only move to an adjacent cell that has all four walls so if you started the carving from here it wouldn't go anywhere so we have to start it from somewhere inside the maze. We could pick the center point of the picture. There's no guarantee that that is somewhere that has pixels, but you could start there and it would work. Alternatively, as I've done, you can just loop through all the cell, all the rows and all the cells until we find one that has walls. And then at that point, start there. So this is a nice starting point. We've got a maze, it looks like some balloons just about, but we've lost the definition because we had three stacked balloons. So we experiment a bit further and well, as we're looping through the pixels, we know what color those pixels are. So we could actually create another array that is a map of at this location, use this color and we can draw the walls using that. When I first did this, it had some problems because we've got a PNG, we actually have some pixels that are semi-transparent. So I ran it again and took out the alpha channel. So we're just looking at the RGB value and the walls became a bit more distinct, but it didn't still quite look right. So instead I flipped it round and put the background color of the cells to the original background color of the, uh, uh, of the, of the original image. Remembering one cell in our maze here is equivalent to one pixel. And it's generally worked. Some of the uh, some of the pixels have come out uh, a funny color, and we can uh, we can sort that out later. We also don't have an exit or an entrance to our maze, so we can't actually solve it properly. 
And as I said before, we can put an exit and an entrance on the maze by picking any two points. So the easiest thing to do is just pick the very first cell that we find and carve a hole in on the left hand side and then take the very last cell in our maze and carve a hole out there. The final bit would be to draw a line that shows the solution. Um, and we can do that by using the same algorithm as we did to create the maze, the backtracker algorithm. So we go through each cell one by one. And if we get to a dead end, we back back out and then we go up another path until eventually we find our target and then we can render it on top of it. I haven't done that yet. That's kind of next on my my list to experiment with. The code for this is on GitHub um, at image to maze. And we're going to take a quick look at that code now. And we're going to generate a maze live. So we'll just flip over to the code. So this is the uh, Visual Studio solution and it has the code that we, we just had a look at. It has been broken out a little bit. So we have a maze generator here that returns the grid, which is a two dimensional array of that direction uh, flag Xena. And it also uh, finds the start and finds the, the end. We also have an image loader, which is the image loading code that we looked at. There is a limit. I've put in 500 pixels by 500. It is a little bit of an arbitrary limit. If you put too large an image in, it's just going to take a very long time and be really hard to solve. So just put an arbitrary limit of 500, 500. What I've found is that an image of about 40 to 100 pixels is about the right size because although it may be one pixel in the source image, when we draw out the maze, we're drawing each maze at sort of 50 pixels, each cell in that maze at 50 pixels wide. So we're creating a lot, lot larger image. Now where I get these images from so far for all of the experiments, I have been using, um, I'm not very good at drawing, so I've been using Icon Finder and finding images that are on Creative Commons license that allow you to remix them. I then pick the a, an appropriate size, maybe a 48 or a 64, or in some cases, even 128. So if we go back and let's search now for a new um, a new one for uh, Unicorn. OK, and we're going to take this image here. So we're going to download the, uh, the 64 one and that's downloaded. So now if we run our application, this application at this point, the program CS file um, is just using our open file of open dialog and uh, save dialog and then calling the maze algorithm. There are lots of options that we can pass in, for example, to fill in the background color and various other bits and pieces. And these are all just hard coded in. In time, probably create a UI that will allow you to, uh, to, to modify these. So if we just run this now, this application runs, it's popped up the, uh, the dialog and we can see our unicorn image that we've got got there. So I'll just grab the previous one because that's the right size. It's then now asking us where to save it. So I'm just going to save it on top of an old file called unicorn.jpg. And you see that is how quick it is to generate the maze. If I now open that image, bring it across onto this screen, we can now see we have a maze, an entrance at the bottom here at the foot. You can go up through the maze and out there. That's quite a, a pretty maze. We could use that on a birthday card or various other bits uh, and pieces. So that's how the application works. Um, as I say there's a lot more that can be done. It is on GitHub if you want to look through the code or if you want to contribute, you can also do that. What other things we can we do though? If you've been inspired by this and you want to look at mazes more, what other directions can we go? Well, the first thing to note is that this code is in C sharp. So theoretically, we could go and generate a 3D maze inside Unity 3D. 
So use the, the grid data to build walls with um, three dimensional walls and you can actually navigate through it or you can make a 2D game with it. Alternatively, we could generate circular mazes or we could change the cell shapes. So instead of having squares as our grid cells, we could have hexagons or triangles or, or various other bits. A maze type that I experimented with before was an SVG tile. So rather than actually drawing the maze um, out using GDI and with individual lines, I created a set of tiles and then loaded those in based on the exits and entrance from that particular cell. And this gives us lots more options if we can start to uh, start to use SVGs. Um, you can't see it very clearly here, but these are actually roads um, and some of the other tiles that I later went on to do had like houses in and various other bits and pieces. You can also add bridges and tunnels to your maze. So uh, yeah, so that can add a bit more complexity to it. And you've got the option of creating 3D mazes. I've seen them with cubes and various other bits and pieces. So that brings us to the end of the presentation. Thank you for listening. And if you've got any questions, um, put, do put them in the, uh, in the chat. And um, yeah, you can find me at John Kilmister on Twitter or my blog is at blueboxes.co.uk. Don't think we've got any questions. I'll give it a minute or so, but don't think we do. Okay, we'll leave it there. Thank you, everybody.